agenda today and we can go through them. But first of all, uh, let's start talking about the editor program and kind of get a few, a little bit of the preliminary feedback from you. If, if you are a part of not a part of the editor program, how do you feel about the progress so far? Do you like what's going on on Research Hub? Do, do, you, do you find it interesting to dig through the content or it didn't change for you personally? Well, <clears throat> I'm personally just getting more involved uh, simply because of the holidays. So it's kind of hard to say. Do you get... Uh, would you say do you have enough people in your hub to consistently get conversations going or not as well? um no which is why i brought up uh reaching out to more people it said 48 mm -hmm. people are members of our hub um but um yeah i don't know actually um there's some conversation going um It might be too early for me to judge, though. Um, I think um, I'll give it a couple more weeks before saying. Makes sense. What has someone else's experience been so far? Yeah, so I could I could speak for uh, the neuroscience hub. Um, I think it's we're still in pretty early stages. Um, I think there's a lot of a little bit more activity ramping up like on the editor side to help facilitate some things, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I think, um, you know, maybe help support using a little bit of research coin here and there, some ideas and um, make comments on some hypotheses that people throw out there. So I think there's a little bit more activity and I think we're, I think we're in the early stages. And um, I think the more users that compound um, in there, then the more kind of exponential all the discussions are because people start you know, networking with each other and threads start forming and things. So I think, yeah, as long as we keep having a constant influx uh, of people, you know, over the weeks, then I think, um, yeah, we should pick up on uh, some of the engagement. Gotcha. All right. So basically what I'm hearing is too early to tell, but looks optimistic so far. All right. So one topic that we would really want to discuss is For us as a community, not necessarily the, the editors themselves, what do you think would be the, the reasonable and concrete metrics or indicators that maybe the editor is falling behind a little bit and how we should we handle maybe nudging them in the right direction? So it's you know a comfortable process for everyone involved. Yeah, that's really hard, right? Because if you set really specific metrics, then people might just do that, but not, you know, create truly valuable conversation. Um, maybe something where people can collectively vote on the performance of the editor. Um, just might lead to like collect collective heuristics might be like the best um, way of judging. I don't know. But I think if you set really specific metrics, you know, people might end up trying to game the system, essentially. In a way, like it depends. I think, I think if you pick the right metrics, I think it's okay. Like if we pick something like weekly active users um, on a certain hub, I think that's always good. The hardest part is like defining what uh, weekly active users mean. That's always hard like as a, on a SaaS product as well. For us, it could be a number of threads um, being created, a number of comments generated. Uh, you could use that as an early, it's, it's gonna be a trial and error, uh, but activity engagement is usually a good um, starting point. Because you get you know, you get your acquisition, you get your engagement, and then you gotta work up to your network effects in a way. So I'd say pick a couple, uh, but I like like the weekly active users, monthly active users, daily active users. Would you be would you be okay with the fact that it's disproportionately affecting people with the bigger hubs versus smaller hubs because you can't really control your own users, you know? Exactly, and that's like yeah. that's why it's hard because especially, especially this network. Network. 
Mm -hmm. I was going to mention, because I've only got, uh, there's only two of us in the clinical psych hub. So if one of us is a little bit less active, let's say, um, you know, we only have four users subscribed to our hub currently. So maybe it's just a problem for the early stages. Hopefully it'll fizzle out and we'll get growth. But yeah, for now, it's hard to gauge when you have a small sample size of editors and, and subscribers to the hub. Okay, so do you have any ideas for maybe the metrics that we could measure in the editor performance that they're not necessarily easy to games to game perhaps, but something that's a reasonable maybe baseline, bare minimum, because otherwise we we have no you know no guidance in our decision making. It depends. Like, uh, what's the overarching goal, I guess, this research hub, and then creating like things that support that overarching goal. Um, something I'd say it'd be kind of like unique users over a number of threads. Uh, it would probably be two raw metrics you could ratio together that would show like activity. Um, that's just an idea. Oh, of course, open to everybody else. Hi, yeah, I know I'm relatively new to the editor program, but it's possible that we might need another month to know exactly what might be the criteria. Like it sounds like it might be too early and too unpredictable at this time. So you mean like wait a month and see, get kind of the average of what all you editors do and that would be the, the goal? Yeah, like right now it doesn't seem like there's any sort of consensus at all on what the metric should be. And it, you know, maybe we just need more time to kind of see what makes sense. Yeah, I, I personally totally agree with that, that I think for the first month or so, we should not really have like, you know, not necessarily ping people even if they're inactive, like just see kind of in like a attention to treat kind of way, like what do people do when they're unprompted? And like after a month, get everybody in the same room, try and figure out what's working. Um, Joe, you brought up a great point though, where like um, you could get creative with the metrics. We have like a dashboard uh, that we've been using internally with like weekly active users and a couple other events on the website. Um, so we could invite anybody who's interested to be able to view these metrics and then like try and suggest like creative combinations, um, you know, whether that's like, like weekly active users over new users or like whatever you suggest. So if people are interested in that, we can try and make that happen. Um, hi, I'm Janelle. I'm a new editor too, so I don't have too much to add here, but I would say starting out, what would be helpful for me, which you've already kind of done, is outline a few, you know, maybe minimum standards for the first month, like things that we think before we have the data might be good, like, you know, number of papers posted, number of comments made, um, just to have some baseline, like what, what should I be doing here? Um, and then I think it makes a lot of sense to regroup after a month or two and assess what seems to be the most um, productive as far as posting and things like that based on user feedback. And that's also a fair point, right? I, I agree that it would be nice to get a view of how editors would behave un unprompted, but also a lot of editors have been reaching out for you know, for directions, right? So well, what is the number of papers and comments, the ballpark that they should be looking for? I think that ballpark um, will, I think, flush itself out. If once we like have everyone kind of be a as active as possible, we'll get like kind of like a normal distribution of people who are like uploading documents. So maybe you'll have some people who upload five papers and some people upload 50 papers and, and just, we just see where the normal mean of that is and kind of maybe adjust up or down according, according to that. But like, I think like everyone said, like maybe we, free for all for the month but we keep a set of metrics in our kind of on our site which would be like yeah like daily active users with active users number of uh, comments uh, number of uh, papers uploaded um, number of um, hypotheses generated in your hub um, some things like that and then we just see where the the normal distribution lies across all of those So I guess if if the consensus so far is that we should probably base those goals of the data we get from the first month 
So should, what should we discuss the actions, the notification that you know for yeah. in, inactivity, inactivity now or, now or in a month? In a month. I was wondering if it'd be helpful to have like a dashboard built for editors, like for each of the hubs to say like, here's the metrics for the week or the month here. And like, here's a trend. And potentially once we figure out what those quantified variables are that we're trying to track, you know, throw those in, in there as well. So it's all kind of on one dashboard for the, the editors to kind of see, you know, what papers need to be approved or thrown off the website or like, you know, what comments are there for review, things like that. Yeah, so that, that's a great point. That's actually exactly what we're building over the next two weeks. So uh, our engineering team essentially is crushing a bunch of bugs um, as, as they pop up. And then we're also building this editor dashboard where it'll kind of be like the leaderboard uh, just for editors. And you can like kind of sort it by like most active, least active, like different parameters, papers posted, discussions, stuff like that. Um, we, we also have Amplitude, as I mentioned, which has kind of like non-hub specific metrics. And so I think we'll be able to have hub specific ones added to this, and then we can invite editors to this. So that way they have like a better picture of what's happening in their hub. All right, that sounds good to me. Should we move on to the next topic or does anyone have any further comments on the editor activity? Right, so another thing we can discuss is the nested hubs idea, right? So in many areas of science, there are established taxonomies, right? So for example, uh, where there is a broader branch that includes a more specific branch, for example, in my area, in psychology, within psychology, there would be social psychology, cognitive psychology, et cetera. However, this also can be a more complicated procedure or taxonomy, right? For example, with a cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience, right? They overlap a lot. They include more or less, you know, same-ish areas besides the neuro part, right? So how would they coexist within each other, or both within psychology? Would psychology exist within biology, et cetera? Thoughts? Yeah, I think there there should be a, a nested structure inside the the hub that should basically define uh, different uh, parameters. Like, uh, for example, in my case, uh, where I have the, the 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 sensing and biosensing hub, for example, one discrimination could be done based on the application of sensors. For example, another one could be, uh, for example, based on the on the field. Or another one could be like a technical differentiation between uh, different type of sensors. So this should be not only like or like vertical, but also like horizontal. So uh, this could be something that we could uh, take into account. For example, when uh, you have like a, like a hub that could spread around across like different fields. Like in my in my case, for example, uh, you could have. Like for example, sensors that are applied in automotive, that are applied in environmental type of stuff, in medicine and so on. So how do you really like method in only in, in like one hub? It should be spread across different hubs. And actually other people from different hubs should be able to see the stuff uh, in this hub and should be able to contribute because maybe they could have like, they could give contribution from a different field, but that can be applied into another one. That's how you, I think you create like a lively discussion and really you, you create a value of what we're doing, like connecting people, even like from different fields. So with the horizontal hubs, would it would it be solved by just putting more than one hub on the paper you're uploading? Yeah, that could be. Yeah, that could be one. That could be one type of like uh, thing that can be done, or having like uh, I'm thinking like the first idea that I got was like just du duplicating the hub in like different like fields, uh, but that could probably create some uh, like misunderstanding. Like if you see, if you see the same name of the hub in different, uh, I call it hubs because there's like major, uh, like categories. If you see like the same name of the hub in different categories, uh, that could arise some like misunderstanding. So uh, should, that should be uh, hopefully engineered in a way that is not, it's comprehensive, but it's not confusing. 
Ricardo, one way we thought about this in the past is like having nested hubs, but also allowing users to tag papers. So like if it's if it's a like a, a sensor, you know, that could be like quantum sensing or biosensing. So those are two very different hubs, but you could have like this a sensor tag on it. So that way, like if you wanted to search by that tag, you could see like every paper that has to do with sensing, regardless of the hub it's in. Um we Yeah, that's we, great. Okay, cool. that's, that's basically what I'm doing now for like the bio. Given given that the biosensing hub is new, what I'm doing is basically I'm relocating biosensing papers from different hubs. So I'm just like searching for biosensors uh, on different papers and just like putting them into my into my hub. Uh, on that front, should we have um like a kind of an open free for all of what to type in to like add that tag, or should we have like a set of like tags curated? kind of by research hub. So that way there's someone who doesn't put like, I don't know, like biosensor with a capital S and biosensor with a lowercase s. And now we have two different things that people are just adding to, but it's not cohesive. Maybe we should have think, a research hub like generated list. Actually, I think the, the editor itself could suggest that. Could be a oh, great yeah. idea for an editor role, like suggesting hashtag for his hub. Okay, okay. Uh, I have a comment on the nested classification. Um, to me, it seems kind of early to start doing that because um, it seems to me like that would be something that would you would implement later on once you start kind of getting, you know, like in the tens of thousands of papers uploaded. But when you have, like, for example, in my particular hub, there's only one or two right now. So um, there's a danger in getting too specific too early where um, people won't see it if it's kind of deep into the nested structure. And it seems like it might be overcomplicating something this early on. Um, definitely like later on, as you get lar a larger amount of content, you want to organize it that way. But, um, and maybe some hubs are already getting to that point, but I don't, I think that it could actually add um, unnecessary complication. That's a fair point. Uh, does anyone share this opinion? Uh, yeah. 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 Please start. Okay. Uh, so, in addition to what Jennifer was saying, uh, I don't see the practical benefit of having a nested structure in addition to a tagging structure, because I think tagging solves the problem in itself. Uh, so, if I want to see social psychology, for example, I can just click on the tag for psychology and social psychology or just for social psychology for that matter. Uh, I don't see the benefit of having a nested structure at all uh, in this. We don't have appropriate context here, but the benefit of a nested structure is we have the potential to eventually like uh, allow people to have weighted votes based on their expertise. So like if you're a clinical psychologist, you know, with a PhD, your opinion could be worth more than like an undergrad psychology. And then we could do that in a way where like um, maybe cognitive psychology, your weight vote is the most, but then also in psychology, you have like a higher weight compared to a like, lay person. There's basically weighted voting is the feature in the future that that would help with. But yeah, I kind of totally agree. Uh, and with Jennifer's comment too, that's sort of where our team, our, our head is at, is that like maybe nested hubs are too complex of a feature for the current moment, but will absolutely become necessary, you know, at, at some point in the future. Patrick, um, I, I wonder if you could combine the ideas a little bit and say that there are higher order level tags. Like I'll use a category level tag. You've got topic level tags as you get into research papers, you know, there may be something on like um, in biology, like targeted drug delivery, you know, via the different ways that you could do that, whether it's the nanoparticles or AAVs or whatever the case is. That, that seems like, you know, and lots of research papers already have this, like what are the things that are mentioned in there? So if you had some that are designated as category level tags, you could still then associate it with experts in that area that are experts in that category level, perhaps. Yeah, that's a great point. That could be a good like uh, intermediate solution. It's just having like a robust tag system built in. 
I'm wondering, could we also display the data instead of it being hierarchical and, and sort of nested? Uh, we could keep that, but also have like a word cloud kind of thing. Like, I don't know if anyone's used um, Roam Research, but you know, you kind of enter your user generated like notes and then it kind of creates these like bubbles of like, here's psychology, here's clinical psychology and how big those visualized bubbles would be, would be how many papers are on that hub. But it's a good visualization of like zooming into the general field of psychology and then social psych or clinical psych and then kind of visualizing it that way. Like, would that make sense? Yeah, it's, totally. it, it, it's kind of like a bo it's like kind of like a data driven uh, category creation, right? I think we might need more submissions for that to be effective. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So also, the next mm -hmm, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, going back to Jennifer' um, comment, I I also think that like for hubs where you don't have many papers, uh, the vested the nested structure now could be a little bit like too much, too over like overly complicated. But like for example, this tagging procedure that doesn't have to like involve the the nested structure. Like you can start doing it like since the very first paper. Like for example, one of the things that you could have uh, that you could do when you upload a paper is just putting down like five uh, hashtags that maybe could be useful in the future. At least you don't have to do it all the all at once when we decide to implement something new. It's something that maybe you can do, like start doing when you upload a new paper. That's an interesting idea. Who, uh, who is currently, who has currently, um the right to change the hubs and do you think in the future should be able to add tags is it only the people who submit the articles and can edit their own submissions or the editors or anyone patrick do you know so right now anyone can change it um i think moderators have like kind of the final say but anyone's able to add additional tags to any paper at the moment or, or hubs not tags what about removing hubs? Yeah, I think I think anyone can do it currently. Okay. Uh, do 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 we want to change that to just be editors unless you were the person who submitted the article for now? Thoughts? It's probably reasonable, right? Yeah, it makes sense to me. I was just worried that maybe some editors, you know, would put in a lot of work to try to organize their papers they're submitting and you know put put tags and HUD and everything, but but then we can't guarantee that a random user wouldn't change that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We'll also have to make sure that nobody abuses the tagging system so that it doesn't turn into Instagram because we just tag them as much as possible to gain maximum uh, visibility for the paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we limit the number of tags or something like that. Um, yeah, I agree. It can be a little weird. I'm thinking though, in the future, when we have a tagging system, we probably want to, it'll be nice if we can tie together, like, uh, like imagine clicking on a tag, you'll be able to see not only like papers, but also comments. Like, I don't think like uh, a paper is necessarily the only data point that can be tagged, but comments can be tagged and stuff like that. So interesting points you guys are making. Yeah, it's good for your, like, you know, your search system that you'll eventually have to build out, like getting all that user generated data, like for you guys, it's gonna be very helpful. Yeah, and I guess the good, the use case, the the main case for doing this now is that if we do start the tagging system early, then like you said, Joey, like we're collecting data early and then we can do leverage it uh, later on. And Just so everybody knows too, if you haven't been to a prior community called Kobe, he's one of the engineers on the research hub team. So he's responsible for doing a lot of the product work when it comes to like what we actually build up future-wise. 
Um, sort of adding to this conversation too, I remember a paper like maybe two, three years ago, there's some kind of ML algorithm that was actually able to read scientific papers and classify them based on their content. So it's possible that even the tagging could be done in an automatic fashion um, at some point in the future. It could be a little bit of a heavy lift at this exact time, but I could see it being like, you know, in theory, like a, a not necessarily unbiased, but like a kind of automated way to tag papers. Hey, hey, Patrick. I, I, no. Yeah, Patrick. Oh, sorry. I had a, uh, maybe some of the other people can jump in. I had a, this, uh, a feature idea that I think would um, uh, kind of streamline the process for people because I'm, I'm thinking like one thing that might be kind of like a little hurdle and, you know, it's not really that big of a deal, but, you know, you have to go on the website and then you have to like find your NCBI paper and then you have to like copy and paste, the, you know, the link and things like that. Is it possible to have some kind of um, just right-click function? When, so, like, because researchers are going to be on NCBI no matter no matter what. So, can can we have like a right-click feature where you're just going through it and just you can hit right-click and and then just say upload this to Research Hub and that just cuts out even needing to like remove your flow of going through the papers. You just kind of say, hey, move it to Research Hub and then maybe. Um, implement that algorithm that you just talked about to have it auto fill in and put in hubs on that end. Um, I think that would just allow people to continue doing what they usually do, but just one or two seconds to port it over. It's a great idea. Um, it'd be interesting to see if other people felt similar. One of like the initial features we talked about like two years ago was to build a Chrome extension. It's kind of like unpaywall. If you guys have ever used that before, where automatically like an unlock button will open if you see a paywall version where it's also open or hosted openly elsewhere. So we could do something where like a little like um, maybe research hub button shows up on a paper if it hasn't been added to research hub yet, or is it something right click similarly? So curious if others would find that useful. Uh, again, uh, just to chime in with the uh, like uh, using like machine learning uh, to pick up on the so when we do systematic reviews, I've, I've tried using they, they use like natural and language processing models to like identify the, the topic of these articles, and they're they're like not even close to uh, usability. Like there's a lot of still like secondary tricks you got to do. I'd say I wouldn't rely on those technologies yet. It's maybe like in, in the far future, but. Just playing around with them, even like this year uh, or this past year, uh, they're they're still very early stages. Um, <clears throat> I just want to chime in real quick. I I agree with with Jeff the idea of having some sort of integration, just because then it, you wouldn't have to be taken out of that mindset um, there. But definitely, when that happened, there'd have to be some sort of framework in place to prevent just a massive onslaught of of papers from the ease of, of access. But I think I think that's a great idea to uh, facilitate import of info in here. All right, uh, should we move on to the next item on the agenda? Okay, so like your opinions on the matter, pros and cons of removing the DOI as a requirement to submit paper. Uh, a little bit of context, that was one of the measures uh, we took a long time ago when there was a spammer activity on, on the rise, right? That, that was a quick fix so that they at least upload, you know, scientific articles if they want to upload something in mass and not, you know, their vacuum cleaner instruction as they often did. Uh, however, it is uh, creating a bit of a hustle right now, right, for some submission types. So thoughts. Can you talk a little bit about what the problem is with having the DOI there, just for those of us who are unfamiliar with the issue? Well, so in my case, especially <clears throat> when it comes to law, there are a lot of papers that simply don't have DOI um, numbers. So it's it really cuts out a lot of what's possible. Um, and I don't know if that's true for other um, hubs, but in my case, it definitely limits. And it could be something where, you know, perhaps, 
you know, is hub specific. Um, yeah, if he can, my, go ahead. Yeah, I think maybe we can make it like a custom button for editors to like turn it off and turn it on. So some people in some hubs can have it as a requirement and some people can have it as optional because in psychology, I think most papers do have DOIs and psychology is very prone to vacuum cleaner instructions as a submissions. So yeah, I think it might be very useful in some hubs and very not useful in others. That's one fix. I don't know that 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 sounds like it would require some engineering on on the side of the team. Uh, the easier solution perhaps would be is so that the editors can post without DOIs. That's not an ideal solution, of course. So what we've done already is remove the DOI requirement. So right now, um, anyone can post anything even without a DOI. I actually think it may be that you have to put in like any like character in the DOI like field, but that it doesn't have to have a real DOI in order to be posted. I think we're removing this um, in the next day or two just to make it easier for people. And I think what we can do is like if all of a sudden we see or start to see a lot of vacuum cleaner instructions then reassess and think about building like hub specific like uh, abilities to customize the um, submission sheet. Kobe, were you here for the hub specific part? I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I think it's not that difficult to do, uh, but I agree, maybe we start with like uh, removing the DUI restriction from the front end. If we get start to get some spam, we, uh, we do some kind of a hub specific, uh, you know, requirement of DUI. Well, the hub specific requirement may not deal with spam. So we might want to think about how to deal with spam, you know, differently, not have it be related to DOIs. Yeah, spam is always a difficult thing. And it's kind of like, a, it's like never a good, a great solution. It's just like, a, what is uh, always trying to identify a deterrent that will cut like most of the spam. You know what I mean? It's like the DOI cut like I think 98% of spam or something like that. But uh, yeah, no, it's definitely a good point. I'm really curious to see if it comes back and if it does, then we'll punch it. Do we have any other mechanisms then to ensure that uh, the papers uploaded are unique? I mean, especially later on when there's a large volume of papers being uploaded. I mean, yeah, if, if editors get to go over it, is it just, I guess, yeah, they could spam the editors as well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess, let me ask you guys this. What do you guys think about the uniqueness problem is always interesting. Is it... Um, yeah, I guess if you want to keep the comments, like, you know, you don't want to recreate the comment threads and people like uh, starting a new discussion. So in that sense, it's like uh, something to be avoided. Uh, Reddit, for example, it doesn't care. You can submit the same thing 10 times, don't care, because I guess they have like a huge volume of people. So it makes sense that they don't care. But the DOI does solve that problem to a degree, because if you do enter a paper, then we can pull that up um uh yeah anyway i'm just thinking out loud so it is a, an interesting problem here i think uniqueness is important here and uh we can't overlook it because if something is getting reposted uh in the future if you want to map out papers so for example this paper mm -hmm. references this one we won't be able to do that if there are three variants of each paper yeah, one one thing we can do is like uh, look at the title or some like obvious things and and at least um, right now when you enter a paper with uh, a DOI that does match, we do like surface like oh this paper already exists and we block you because we know it's the same DOI. But in the future, if we do remove the DOI, what we can do is maybe show up some suggestions like hey this is might be the same paper. Are you sure you want to upload it? and uh, kind of mm -hmm. like as uh, letting the user make uh, the final decision. Uh, also, I'm not sure if uh, this is relevant here, but 
uh, if a paper does not have a, a DOI, uh, what's wrong with posting it as a post, uh, a common post? Uh, I think that if you are to do that, you could do that, but you would just need to, I guess it's like a, it could work, but it's just, a, uh, yeah, I don't know. It might not be like what it was used for. That's what, uh, but it could work. Yeah. I think the challenge would be you have to like copy and paste all the content rather than just uploading a PDF document. So like you could do that in theory, just it would be right. kind of a pain to do it. Especially with citations, maintaining yeah. the, the format, it's weird. The DOI thing, yeah, you guys, you're taking out the requirement, but is it, is it still like keeping track of the DOI like in the background? Like you still have that data point at least? That sounds like, mm -hmm. okay, that's good, cool. For uploading um, a paper with no no DOI, I, I think mostly like kind of biological like studies, DOIs are pretty mandatory. But for not one, so like in law, can you have it where it just if somebody tries to submit something without a DOI, it would just um, kind of send kind of filter that through the editor first, so that would it would relay it to the editor, and then the editor has the discretion of like uploading it and making sure it's not like been posted and things like that um that way it would like it, it would suck because it then just it kind of maybe it gets bottlenecked or falls on the the editor to make those decisions but uh, it might be more work for people who are in hubs that don't have dois but i think that would be a way where you can filter away um filter away some of the the jargon and the yeah the jumbledness of no dois yeah, kind of. I, I like this idea. Maybe kind of like a casual flag on all papers that are submitted without DOI, unless manually approved by editors. Uh, Edwin, uh, how do journals keep track of papers right now without DOI? So, for example, what do they use to identify them, if not the DOI number? If you have any idea about that. I actually don't know. The URL. Is it possible? They use the URL address for, for papers, for some papers that don't have the UI. I don't know if, don't know if it's possible like, to do that. Yeah, that would... consider like a electronic resource if it's on the internet, probably. Yeah, there's, there's a different category it falls under. Yeah. yeah. I like the idea actually of some of the papers, like the papers that don't have the UI going through the editor. Because that's, I think, going to be like a marginal part, like, with, like, related to, like, with comparison to all the other papers. So as you said, in some house, maybe that could be more, a little bit more work, but that will definitely limit the, the quantity of like spam that we, that we get. I agree. Yeah, and the barrier, the barrier of entry for someone, it disincentivizes anyone to spam because if they, <laughs> if they have like a multiple day waiting time and someone's filtering through their, their thing, they're just, disincentivized to throw a hundred articles, you know, your way that are just spam. So I think it, it might solve the problem. Do you think it might be possible to have um, a bot that filters out for the editor, like common spam items that maybe you could write? I don't know how easy that would be to write though. And maybe if you um, compensated, uh, editors or people who have uploaded or are some way like accredited in some way by the platform, um, then they would be happy to go through a pile of things that need reviewing, you know? I mean, I mean, not like maybe a lot, but it's just a way to incentivize it potentially. Yes, that's a great idea. We're using Sift right now, which is like a kind of machine learning product that uh, tries to remove like very obvious spam so we just get all these comments that were like, like, yeah, hammer, exclamation point. And they're still coming, but um, the machine learning filter does a good job at removing like those very obvious spam cases. Um, sometimes like there are things that are in between. So like you can have like a, like maybe like instructions on a like pharmaceutical product 
right? Where it's like a PDF that's uploaded, where it's really not an article, it's not really a scientific thing, but like it's close enough where the machine learning filter gets kind of confused. And so I, I think getting that, like, like we've got 80% of the spam wrapped up with the machine learning filter, but the remaining 20 is like a pretty difficult task to, to engineer. Um, and I think really relying on humans is going to be the best way to go about it until we can kind of pay for like a team to be managing that. You could also look at like, uh, use like data to help filter, like, because it's going to be a lot of work for the moderator for sure. Like, uh, the ratio of un DOI, non DOI posts to DOI posts. And then, you know, if the ratio gets really messed up, like it, fl it flags that person and then it, in those posts go to like a moderator for approval or something, just so there's some sort of machine to help out the moderator. I don't know, that's just an idea. Yeah, I think these are all good ideas. I think what we can probably do to start off is remove the DOI filter. Um, and then um, given that now we have SIFT, which like as Joyce mentioned, like removes 80% of spam, just see what happens. If this becomes an issue, we will very quickly probably turn it back on temporarily until we like do like a hybrid approach, which is like maybe like hub specific deal or something like that based on the suggestion. But like just FYI, we'll probably just turn it off and see what happens. Maybe nothing happens uh, for the foreseeable future. That's That's good. All right, uh, we still have a few more topics to go through. So let's move on before we run out of time. So next up, we want to discuss how do you think we, sh we should operate the DAO and how should the DAO votes be handled? Uh, Jeffrey has been pretty active in proposing how we can handle the voting and uh, how the Olympus DAO can be used to solve our potential liquidity problems. I don't know, if Jeffrey, if you want to say a few words, if not, that's okay. Yeah, I can say some stuff really quick. So um, there's a doodle poll and actually I'll, I'll put it into the chat right now. Uh, we're trying to lock in a time to discuss some of the liquidity um, solutions that we have. Um, so I'll put that in the poll uh, or in the chat right now. But um, so right now I'm drafting up a framework which will have just kind of a standard um, kind of format for how you would submit a proposal, um, probably go through snapshot. Um, so there's, um, some things that uh, we can discuss about. So, um, and maybe if um, Kobe or Joey, um, so the way Snapshot works is uh, whatever amount of research coin you have in your MetaMask wallet, it takes a snapshot at, at that block and then your voting power is based off of how much RSC you have in there. But for people who leave their RSC on the website, is there a way to kind of create like a hybrid, just kind of add what's on the website and in the MetaMask wallet? Um, and then if not, we have to think about a way to allow people who have small amounts of RSC to continue to vote because it's expensive with the ETH fees to move off to your MetaMask wallet. Yeah, so actually we spoke about this this morning in our engineering sync, and there is a way to tie like a MetaMask wallet to someone's user account on Research Hub. So yeah, basically we'd be able to just say, hey, this wallet is assigned this account's uh, tokens, and then they'd be able to vote with what's both like on chain and in a research hub user account. So we're we're working on that. Uh, should have it ready within a couple weeks. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And then um, there were some some uh, definitely some other points I wanted to like throw out to the community, which would be um, in terms of so what I, what I see with um, in the Olympus DAO snapshot is they don't have any filter for who can propose something. And so you have all this spam coming through on snapshot of just some kind of dumb, you know, proposals. Um, do we want to make it such that anybody can propose something and it goes to a vote? Or do we want to make it such that um, maybe editors or like some kind of core team put out proposals, but everyone is allowed to vote on them? Good question. We'll have to figure out the guidelines on how to how the voting works, right? And maybe the whether the votes are kept to keep it fair, maybe tied to reputation on the research hub. Those are all the decisions we need to think through. Have you guys looked at how other DAOs 
do it, especially the larger ones? Um, yeah, so some of the larger ones, um, it's kind of, it's mixed or match. So like I said, Olympus is a fairly big DAO. They go about it um, where anybody can upload. Um, there's some other ones that go about it where there's only like a policy team or core team that um, sends out the, generates the proposals, but everybody can vote on that. Um, you know, so it would be up to our discretion, you know, how we wanted to do it. Um, obviously, uh, one way kind of maintains like the ethos of complete de decentralization where anybody should be able to do it, but then spam starts coming through and you have a lot of like noise among the signal. So I, if, um, personally, I would think that, um, it kind of a more of a kind of editor or core team comes up with some of the proposals. Um, but we still, um, you know, hear out the community in case we want to make um, some adjustments to those proposals according to the kind of the voice of the community, and then everyone is allowed to vote. Well, for now, we're probably not going to get that many proposals from the community, so it might make sense to have them just submitted to the editors um, and then sort of modify based on traffic as we go forward. Okay, cool. So do you mean like uh, sh uh, draft a proposal and then share it publicly and make it possible so people leave comments and then they address the comments and then it goes into the voting phase? Yes. Yeah, that's that's generally how it goes is it goes to a kind of like a, an internal vote in some of the other DAOs. Um, and if kind of the core team says, hey, you know, this this looks pretty good, let's, let's throw it out for uh, kind of public voting across the board. Jeffrey, did you notice that a lot of them um, have like a minimum threshold that you have to own to put, propose a, a change? Um, I don't know. I, that was one thing that I actually was thinking of when I was like trying to draft some of the stuff up. If we want to have a minimum RSC amount, research coin amount, or um, maybe like a minimum reputation um, score to be able to actually vote it. But uh, we also don't want to kind of leave out maybe um, some people who maybe for some reason or another don't have research coin or some people who say take 500,000 bucks and buy some research coin just to throw out some proposal that maybe might, you know, be nefarious in some type of way. So um, maybe a few, a few parameters can go into that decision making. Yeah. So amount of research coin plus maybe reputation score. So that way it's not someone who's just buying research coin and has no reputation, you know? Personally, I like the idea of having like editors uh, do the proposals. In theory, we'll have enough editors where they'll be like within reach of anyone who wants to suggest a proposal. And um, yeah, so it doesn't really feel like it would necessarily limit like the average person's ability to make proposals. You just have to like pass it through a filter first. And I think this could be like a, um, like kind of a temporary solution um, until like the community matures a little bit and we have like research coin a little bit better distributed and decentralized and then we can kind of like readjust um, on a continual basis. But this feels like a, like a, a easy lift in order to get something going um, in the short to medium term. Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty analogous to like kind of a delegated proof of stake um, kind of governance structure where there's a delegated group of people, but the voices of the community can go through uh, some of those people. So, yeah. Where, where do you guys uh, want the discussion for these proposals to happen? I think mm -hmm. um, like one of the things that like Stack Overflow does, they have a meta um, hub like uh whatever they're called like stack uh, and, and they discuss like these things that changes to the site and stuff like that over there do you guys think that it makes sense to like i'm just thinking the future right now we have a lot of the things in slack what if we move away from slack um we lose a lot of the data and that kind of sucks do we want to start using like create a research hub um hub where we discuss these topics. I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts. Uh, 
You mean build build the messenger in the house kind of thing? Yeah, like discussing uh, proposals, like DAO proposals, like I'm imagining like there would be some discussion and like where would that discussion be? Would that be on Slack or would it be done via on a post on the research hub uh, with comments and stuff like that? That makes sense, yeah. I've seen it on like some people use something called Commonwealth. Um, some people have used some things, uh, some people have used Notion. Um, but it, I think something on the website would be, I mean, it's kind of a centralized location for everybody to come together. Um, that's that's kind of, yeah, the overlap of everybody, regardless if they're using Slack or not, they're going to be using Research Hub. So it, yeah, I'm, I'm open to that. I think that that would be great. Okay, ELN cool. with a few modifications probably can be a good place for that. <clears throat> yeah, cool. Yeah, it'll be good to just give a shot to the post feature. I know it's not super comprehensive, but I think it can at least uh, get get the job done here. And we can modify it as need be. We can all we can also pair it with Slack, right? So we can announce it in Slack yeah. and leave a link in Slack. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Uh, from what I know, uh, most most big uh, deals like uh, Uniswap and the likes have this um, governance tab on the main website that um, leads you to a governance page. So I don't know. You, so there's a Uniswap. You, you go to the the main Uniswap page. This. There's a governance tab that leads you to a voting page. Even if it's a third party um, application, it's, uh, there's still a tab that leads you there. So I don't know. We could, we could also try it out. Maybe there'll be a governance tab on the main research hub page that leads you to um, another uh, another page that anyone can vote on a particular uh, idea or anything. Yeah, something that can kind of that. Yeah, totally. Maybe we can even do like a banner, a temporary banner, if it's you know a very important vote for all research hub. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so if uh, there are no more opinions on that topic, we have the last one to discuss. Uh, so. With the layer two, I'm not very knowledgeable, but if there are tech savvy people in the room, so what would be the pros and cons and how doable would be to switch from the Ethereum network to layer two network? Um, so my experience so with L2 would be uh, probably something like Arbitrum and they are, there are um, bridges, uh, so you could bridge your assets um, <clears throat> from uh, ETH to Arbitrum and vice versa um, on like Synapse protocol and things like that, that um, we can have um, maybe on the, on the website, um, maybe on the website, you can have a, like a, a link to that, you know, third party thing to say, Hey, you know, we're, We'll give you your research coin in Ethereum, but like if you would prefer it in Arbitrum, um, maybe there's a link that you can send you to that bridge, and you can bridge it to um, to um, Ar to Arbitrum. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's been that's been my experience. But you still have to pay the fee on Ethereum to move um, from Ethereum to Arbitrum. So maybe that's something that um, uh, maybe on research coin end you can say, hey, I want my Research coin output it into Arbitrum, and then on on our end we could do that um, bridge and then send it out to them. Is that going to be true for all layer twos? Uh, for example, I know um, like zk sync is coming out. I know Polygon bought one of the zk roll up uh, startups uh, for a couple hundred million, but I know like. You know, ZK rollups are supposed to be uh, the layer two scaling solution that allows for way more throughput. Um, and from what I understand of their mechanism, it's not clear to me that switching chains is going to have 
Ethereum fees, but I, I actually am not confident about that. Um, but figuring that out might um, help in deciding which layer two solution to go with if we decide to do that. Well, yeah, I guess like the what are, at least the option is to do layer two or wait for Ethereum 2.0, but it can't do nothing. Uh, is, are those the two options we're kind of probably debating? Well, I know Vitalik has said that in the medium term, roll-up technology is going to be a lot, like a big part of the solution. And I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I'm not that confident in the timeline of Ethereum 2.0. There's just seems like a lot could go on there. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what, what if we did a what if we did a small fraction um, of um, RSC that we uh, we bridge to like some L two for now, um, and then on our end it's sitting in say Arbitrum for example, and then if people choose the option to use that, then it's fine. We have a pool of that, and it just gets sent out to them. But a uh, majority of it could be sitting there waiting in ETH main chain. Um, waiting for, for ETH 2.0, if the option is available for um, anybody. I think that's the point option. We could totally do something like that. We're just a portion of the DAO's uh, research coin is on Arbitrum. There's some layer two, and then, you know, just kind of like have you know, one, one foot and both on for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then you could easily bridge it um, back from Arbitrum back to ETH. Um, and I mean, Arbitrum fees are insanely cheap, much cheaper than the ETH fees. So that would be definitely an easy bridge backwards. For me, I, I think um, um, we could use uh, the main withdrawal function for the website could be linked to an um, earlier two um, scaling solution so that if someone wants to withdraw from um, the, the the main page then it goes directly through the layer two solutions so that so that the person doesn't necessarily need to use the bridge yeah i think the bridge would just be something on um research hub side of things um for them to move between the two uh but then when people output we at least have a supply in the l2 or on main main chain to to fund them so I guess one, one question just to back up a second here is um, I would love to hear everyone's thoughts on gas fees. Like, do we think it's going to, like, be something that drags down Research Hub's growth if we stay on Ethereum and there are gas fees that kind of prevent people from transferring the coins easily? So, so yeah, just to, to talk about the problem first before addressing potential solutions. Yeah, for me, I think, yes. Gas fees is definitely, is definitely a problem, yeah. Especially uh, with smaller transfers and all. Uh, in order to decentralize as much as possible, definitely you have people um, buying smaller portions of it. You, you don't get everyone buying larger portions. And if fees will definitely discourage uh, those who want to maybe get a hold of a small portion of RSC and all that. So fees is definitely a problem, yeah. For now, I don't think if you um, Ethereum 2.0 is our best bet because we don't know exactly when it's coming out. So for me, I think the L2 solution is a temporary solution. For us. I think that's, I think Patrick, though, I agree that like it, the thing is, gas fees is a problem for every all this, a lot of projects, pretty much that are on Ethereum. So it's not just for research coin. So I guess what specifically would research coin benefit from the lower gas fees? As I guess, like I try, I'm trying to figure out because. I don't know if we're at that stage where we're funding research projects with RSC yet. So I guess he's going to be really applicable there. Um, maybe transferring the coins between researchers. Um, I would see the gas fees just maybe benefiting like research hub in general, just because it's less fees transferring out. That'd be the biggest benefit I'd see. Um, aside from that, I, yeah, I don't know. Open to what everyone else to say. So I think Joseph made a great point in that like small transfers do matter and like gas fees when they're like 60 bucks or 100 bucks like it really limits like how much you can send like if the you know transaction fee is going to be a significant portion of the actual total one like um like way long ago one idea which like really motivated me to work on this project was when I was in grad school I spent so much time just like sitting around waiting for gels to run 
and like like wet lab experiments and i was like okay like during this dead time if i could o- or go earn you know five ten bucks that i could then like turn into something that i could go buy lunch with later that day or like go buy a beer after work like that would be a huge attractor for me to use research hub and so if i just want to earn 10 bucks and withdraw it but it's going to cost me 60 bucks to do that like I probably wouldn't waste my time. Like that use case is all of a sudden eliminated for like the grad student who's just trying to kill a couple minutes. So yeah, I think it makes sense. Like having small transfers be prohibitively expensive, I think would damage, especially because a lot of grad students don't have a ton of money, you know? So I think making sure that like small transfers are feasible for like 25 cents, 50 cents or something like that is kind of important just from my perspective. I mean, what's the main benefit of being on Ethereum right now, other than the fact that a lot of other projects are on there. It seems like from, I mean, you know, like it's more decentralized, but from the perspective of a project like this, I'm not sure how much more value being on Ethereum brings as opposed to Cardano or Solana or any of the other major platforms. Um, I think most people choose Ethereum because of the security feature. Ethereum is more decentralized, has more nodes, and all you know, Solana and all these layer two solutions have just a few. I don't know. Usually, it's the team running the nodes and all. So, so decentralization is not really that much with those chains. But Ethereum is more decentralized, and so security is much higher in Ethereum. That's why most people choose it. But from that. Um, scalability is very low yeah yeah i don't know i don't i mean i disagree with that but i think uh, i'm always curious like kobe would probably answer this as well like does it take how much effort is it to switch to let's say solana uh like i I have no idea like like is the whole system you know like i actually have no idea yeah it it would be challenging to switch to solana a layer two we could do but uh we have to basically like redeploy all the smart contracts, rewrite a lot of the integration. So it, it would it would be a significant project if we want to do that. Uh, yeah, Solana's did using Rust. And, um, so it'd be a whole different, like, I guess, coding language as well. Um, I think also Solana's had some downtime uh, for substantial yeah. periods of time um, in the recent past. So I think um, I could see th- I could see the benefit of ETH, but I'm on board with Patrick in I mean, I think a lot of the user base and editors that are going to come in, especially at the beginning, are probably going to be more like graduate student level type of uh, people. I don't think any like tenured professors are going to start rolling in and in droves, you know, at the beginning. And so I think like, yeah, having something that would alleviate some of those gas fees is, would probably be kind of big at the beginning, at least. And yeah. Well, I think they said with the ZK rollups, gas fees are supposed to be like one one hundredth of what they are now, or in the in a in a worst case one tenth. Yeah, yeah, I think um, like a ZK rollups or any L two, you can even go Polygon. I think any of those could be an option. The only thing that we would need to we would need to prepare for is uh, before we do deploy on any of those. Again, we need to provide liquidity on. Because if you just stuck with a bunch of research coin on uh, a ZK rollup, then um, what can you do with it if you can't move it anywhere? Um, so we would just need to know it kind of in advance to prepare the liquidity necessary for whichever um, L2 we decide. I think it's probably also worth looking at converting to Cardano. I know they're building bridges to make it a lot easier, um, not just like the, you know, generating ERC-20 tokens, but um, also having similar smart contracts uh, being translated from Solidity. So I I need to look into that a little bit more, but I think it's probably worth looking into to figure out how difficult that would be. So. Great point. And so we're like five minutes over and want to be conscious of everybody's time. Um, James Lawton is a blockchain developer who's going to help lead our like open source uh, engineering community. So um, one of the first things I think that we're going to try and talk about is how to best um, 
reduce gas fees for early uses of research hub. So we'll start another channel for like open source development where we can kind of dive into like the values of Solana versus like Polygon versus Arbitrum or whatever in a more uh, detailed fashion. But yeah, this has been enlightening. So thank you everybody. All right, that's uh, pretty much it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for input and I will see you all next week. See you everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.